Hey everyone, and welcome to the fourth security topics video. Uh, in today's video, we're going to be covering exploitation with VDSO. Uh, so VDSO, or Virtual Dynamic Shared Object, is a small little library uh, that is automatically mapped into every user land process, uh, and its purpose is to speed up certain syscalls. And so the, research, or the reason I started looking into this was because there was a recent Pwn challenge as part of Cyber Apocalypse 2024 called Pwn Maze of Mist, uh, where we were supposed to uh, ROP using VDSO to uh, get the flag. Um, I missed it, and now that I know what the solution is, it seems like easy points, so I'm a little bit upset about it, but I've done the research, so next time there's a VDSO challenge, I won't miss it, and hopefully after this video, you won't either. Um, so uh, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to give the briefest of introductions to VDSO, and then we're going to do just a bunch of different demos and play with it and see what it looks like, uh, and then we're going to cover quickly the solution to Maze of Mist. Um, we're only going to do part of it, because since once you know the trick, the rest of it's easy, it's just ropping. Um, and then it turns out there's a bunch of related challenges related to VDSO uh, that I've just hadn't seen before. Um, and that's it. So uh, VDSO, like I already said, virtual dynamic shared object. Its purpose is to speed up certain syscalls. Um, for x86-64, there are four of them. There's get time of day, clock get time, get CPU, and time. Um, and so instead of making these syscalls, you can call these VDSO implementations and it'll do the same thing, except it's much faster. Um, and like I said, it's all automatically mapped into all user space applications. If you ever do a, a VM map, uh, you've probably seen it before. Uh, and when I dump it on my, mis or my machine in Ubuntu, it was eight kilobytes. Um, it is passed uh, to, so it is autom automatically mapped uh, by the kernel and its address is passed to the application as part of the auxiliary uh, vector, which we're gonna see in a second. Um, most of the magic related to this is handled by libc. So, as a programmer, you don't have to like do anything special to call one of these VDSO functions inside of the syscall. You just call the standard libc function for get time of day, which we'll see in a second. Um, and it'll do that linking for us, uh, which is very nice and loading. Um, since it's not a real syscall, uh, when I was doing the uh, setcomp slides, it also mentioned that these uh, functions won't pop up uh, in setcomp or you can't prevent them using setcomp. Not that it really matters. None of these functions are very security sensitive, but uh, we'll also take a look at strace and see that you can't actually see these functions get called because uh, their syscalls aren't actually uh, called. Instead, we're doing this like user land implementation of them. Uh, and lastly, more of a historical note, but there used to be something called vsyscall, which was a kind of a prior implementation, but it wasn't part of ASLR. And so because of that, it was a useful exploitation uh, gadget for attackers. So I have a couple of demos. Uh, the first is get time of day. Um, so this little program, all it does is it calls get time of day and prints it out. So get time of day is a libc function and it is also a syscall. Um, so it is syscall 96 on x86-64. On x86 um, so if we compile this and run it, uh, get time of day, uh, and run strace on it, if VDSO is enabled and working correctly, we should not see the syscall. If VDSO is disabled, we should see the syscall because it's going to make syscall 96 and we should see it. Um, so if we run signal trace on it, uh, we can see these are the two write calls to print it out. And right here, we should see the uh, get, uh, get time of day call. Uh, but since we don't, uh, presumably VDSO is working. So uh, to, again, check it even further, we can run it in GDB. Uh, so I'm going to break on main, uh, then I'm going to run. Uh, and let's do a couple things. First, let's check out the memory mappings. So I'm going to type VM map, and we can see we have the memory maps for our binary, for libc, for the loader, and we can see we have a VDSO right here. So from this address to this address, we have read execute for 2000 hex. Um, and so presumably, it looks like VDSO is loaded and hopefully being used. Get time of day is a libc function, and we're calling libc. So ideally, that means that it should exist within the global offset table. Um, so if we do global offset table read only since full railroad was enabled, we can see get time of day here. We can see glibc. Um, so when does it actually call the VDSO function? Is it within libc? Uh, but we can see that's actually not the case. If we copy this address out and we do a VM map on it, we can see that when we do the PLT and it grabs the entry off of the global offset table, it'll actually jump directly to the VDSO. So at some point during the linking process, uh, the global offset table uh, is populated with the uh, VDSO entry for get time of day. Um, one thing that's interesting, uh, part of that process involves a, a simple resolution. And we can see if you do double under VDSO underscore get time of day, um, this is how I think, believe libc knows that this symbol exists and it should be using the VDSO implementation. Um, but don't quote me on that. Um, but it has something to do with uh, 
there being a signal for it. So that all makes sense. So we can step forward. Uh, so we're executing here. I'm just doing single instruction. Oops, single instruction till we get down to the call. So now we're about to call the PLT code, procedure linkage table code for get time of day. So we do a single step. Uh, we have the uh, the NBR64. Then we're going to load and jump the value from the global offset table. And now we're executing the VDSO code for get time of day. Again, we can check that this is the same. Obviously, it should be because uh, it's loaded from the PLT, which we already checked, or the, the global offset table entry, which we already checked. Um, so we can do a single instruction. Uh, and here, uh, it's just doing whatever uh, user space implementation of get time of day. Uh, so there's a couple of interesting things happening on the screen. One, we're seeing a bunch of these cannot dereference these addresses. Um, so it's trying to load uh, R12 into EBX or the, the value pointed to by R12 into EBX, uh, but it's not working. Uh, so that's interesting. Um, so we should investigate that. There's also these fun Alphense calls and RDTSE. Um, so this is read timestamp counter. And so this is a way to see uh, the number of clock cycles that have been executed by your CPU since it's turned on. And there's this fence call. So uh, the CPU, uh, very complex devices, and there's a lot of pipelining and uh, speculative execute. Ex speculative execution things that can be happening. And so when you insert a fence, it basically says like, make sure everything that happened previously has already completed. So you can have certain operations that maybe take many cycles to finish and don't start anything uh, until everything is done. Uh, and this is useful for calls to like RDTSE and uh, getting time because you might use these for performance tracking and you don't want to like grab the time before a previous operation has finished because uh, that's just not good performance tracking. Um, so we have that. Uh, but backing up, like I said, it's very strange that these addresses can't be loaded. Um, and if we actually look where they exist, uh, they exist in a little section called VVAR. Um, it says readable and printable, but for some reason, I guess the, the ptrace, uh, xamn 20 gx I guess ptrace just doesn't work with this section, uh, which is uh, interesting. Um, but that's not going to stop us. Um, the process can read it, so that just means we can make another process that can dump it. And so here I have a little utility called VVAR dump. So what we're going to do here is we're going to grab, um, find that section, and just dump all the memory there and see what's going on. Uh, I didn't mention it in the previous one. Actually, we can do it here. Um, so there's also that auxiliary vector, uh, which we can take a look at. So you can type in auxv to see what it is within pwn debug. Uh, and it was at the symbol for at sysinfo uh, elf header. And so right here is the start of um, the VDSO. And this is how it's passed to the process. And so you can see right here, VDSO, VDSO. Um, so cool. So to grab the start of VDSO within our application, we can just do the same thing. So get auxiliary vector entry for this one. Uh, and then if we look at VM map, we can see it is 4,000 bytes before. Uh, so we're going from here to here. Um, so we're just going to take the VDSO entry and subtract OX4000 to get the VVAR section. Uh, I'm also going to print out the current time and uh, the, the address for VVAR because uh, I think it's useful. So we can compile it. So GCC, uh, we called it VVAR dump. It compiles. When we run it, uh, we can see most of VVAR is empty, uh, but there are some values, uh, which is interesting. And if we go all the way up, I printed out the current time. It is this 17 value uh, in Unix timestamp. And if we scroll down, we can see it exists a couple of times uh, within this VVAR section. Uh, so cool. So the implementation for uh, get time of day and the time syscalls, uh, it looks like they read from this VFAR section, which is mapped from the kernel. And uh, I was going through the kernel source code for these uh, implementations. And from what I can tell from my limited reading is there's this global variable called GTOD, which is global time of day. And it is actually reading um, from this global time of day uh, variable that is mapped by the kernel into this VVAR section uh, to actually provide the user land implementation of get time of day and the other uh, time of day functions. Um, so it is just mapped in by the kernel and so the process can read it from there. And so really this VDSO uh, implementation is just reading this kernel provided variable. Um, again, that is my understanding of it so far. So if you remember, there was also that call to read timestamp, uh, timestamp counter. Um, and you can kind of see some of it here. So it's vget cycles, and here's that barrier call. Um, I believe that is related to uh, the code here that is calculating the number of nanoseconds. So I'm guessing it's somehow using CPU instructions to calculate nanoseconds, uh, just to be very precise, uh, which is pretty cool. So I guess it gets the like the rough time from this kernel mapped variable called global time of day, and then to calculate like you know the very precise amount, it's using this uh, clock cycle thing. Um, so cool. So we can dump it out. 
Uh, one thing I thought about while doing this is, so we have a page that is mapped in from the kernel uh, that all user space applications have access to, um, and it is read-only, uh, but what would happen if we called mProtect on it? Like, can we modify it and corrupt other processes to think that they're running at different times? Um, so, gave it a quick shot. Uh, it doesn't work, spoiler alert, but basically, uh, same sort of thing. We're just going to grab out where the vvar section is, print it out, and then we're going to call mProtect on it. So right now it is only read. Uh, the vvar section is only read, so maybe we can change it to read-write. Um, and see what happens. And then if that did work, uh, I took the af or the offsets for where the timestamp was located just to see if I could change it. If it did work, could I change them? And then in another user space process, uh, see if the time is corrupted. Um, but sadly, it didn't work. I mean, I guess it's good it didn't work. That would have been a very bad bug, but it would have been fun. Um, so GCC uh, mProtect a dot out, and we can see we get a permission denied. Um, I figured maybe we could change it and it would just be a copy on write sort of thing. Um, so we'd have our like own local page that you know isn't reflected to the broader system, but we just get a uh, permission denied. And that's even when I run it with a, a privileged Docker. It could also be that like this is just a Docker thing and maybe on a full Ubuntu or full Linux system it would work. Cool, so those were the demos. Um, like I said, I wanted to talk about how to solve this Pwn Maze of Mist challenge. Um, so this was, like I said, it was part of Cyber Apocalypse. Uh, you can still download the resource files here. There's also a really good write-up from someone way smarter than me, uh, Seven Rocky, uh, that you can find here. So for this challenge, we're given three different files, the init RAM FS, a run script, and the Linux executable, or the kernel. Um, so we can run the run script. This is going to run Kimu and execute our little Linux VM. Um, from here, there's two things to note. Uh, one is that we're running as the user challenger, so we're not root. And second, that there exists this binary called target. Uh, so from this point, we're supposed to extract the file system so that we can make two things or do two things. First, let's extract the target binary into and load it into Ghidra uh, and see what's going on. Uh, I'm not going to do that part. Uh, it's just a standard sort of pwn challenge. There's a buffer overflow. Uh, but what's tricky about the binary is it's very constrained. There's like no gadgets there. There's no way to do anything useful. Um, and at this point, I think as a contestant, you're supposed to think to yourself, like, why are they giving us a full VM? Like, why, if you were to tell Net to this challenge or Netcat to this challenge, uh, you're booted into this right here, which is very, uh, I guess, non-standard for a pwn challenge. Normally that happens when we're doing like a kernel pwn challenge. And so during the CTF, I figured since they also gave us VM Linux uh, or the executable, the kernel executable, I figured this was a kernel challenge, like maybe they modified something. Uh, but like I said, it turns out it was way easier than that. Uh, we were just supposed to leak the addresses of VDSO. Uh, but anyway, so let's leak out the, uh, or let's extract the file system. So uh, make directory file system. Let's copy init ram f is into the file system, cd, fs. Uh, so from here, let's also install CPIO. Um, and then I never remember the commands, uh, so I copied a couple. We're going to copy this one. Uh, so we're going to unzip it, and then we're going to run the CPIO command. Um, not sure why that specific uh, method of uh, uh, compression is used. But anyways, we extracted the uh, file system. So in here, we can see we have target and init. So if we cat out init, this is the script that runs. That sets everything up. Um, we can see specifically uh, it's setting up the flag, setting up the target. Um, we can see this, we're given this plus S uh, to the binary. So if we can somehow get root, we can cat out the flag. Um, we can see that uh, address space lay layout randomization is disabled. And so this was the hint that we were supposed to do uh, VDSO um, or see what other mappings exist because uh, it was very constrained. Uh, and this is where they set the user ID uh, that we're going to run as. So we're running as the uh, challenger user. Uh, instead, we want to run as root so that we can dump out uh, the VDSO. Um, and then we'll recompress the file system and rerun the Kimu binary. Um, so to do that, like I said, we're going to change that init script. So instead of running as uh, that user, we're going to run as uh, user ID 0, uh, so root. Um, and then let's recompress this file system. So first, I'm going to remove the old one. Uh, and then I need to look up the compress script. So it's this one. So we're gonna go up one. This will recompress everything. Cool, so we have our new init RAM FS. So let's go back up. Let's move the old one to backup.cpio.gz. We'll copy the file system one that we just made, init RAM FS to here. Cool, now we can run the run script again. Cool, and now we are running as root. 
So uh, normally during the challenge, you would have taken the target binary out, opened it up in Ghidra, seen the buffer overflow, you see a lack of gadgets. And so now we're looking for more gadgets. Um, so there's two different ways we could do this. Uh, one, we could have found a statically linked GDB and imported it into our init RAM FS so we could run it in GDB and play around. Or you can also just look at proc FS and look at the memory maps. We're gonna do that second one because it's just a little bit faster. So uh, let's play with the target. Uh, we're gonna spawn it as a background process. Uh, now we're going to do PSA UX, figure out the process ID. It's process ID number four. So we're going to proc out the memory maps for that. Maps, there we go. Uh, and we can see there's not much in this binary. There's the target, there's the VVAR, which is just read bull. And then there's the VDSO, which is both read and executable. So at this point, uh, if you knew what you were doing, <laughs> at this point, you would know that this is the solution. Since ASLR is off, we're going to look for gadgets here. Um, cool, so we can dump this. Um, I never remember the, maybe I can do it, but dd in file is equal to proc 74 memory. So we're reading from there. Out file is vdso.so. Uh, then we want to do, uh, is it blocks? I forget already. Byte size. Byte size is equal to one. And then I'm just going to copy the rest. We're going to start at this address. So this in hex is equal to this. And it is 8,000 bytes. So cool. We copied it out, and now we have a dump of the VDSO. Uh, to get it out of the VM, uh, we're just going to base64 it. So first we gzip it uh, to compress it, since a lot of it is just null bytes, uh, VDSO. And then we'll do a base64 VDSO. Cool, cool, so we can copy it out. I'm going to leave the VM, uh, and then we can do an echo. And we'll take this to VDSO.b64. Cool, and then we can do a cat VDSO base64, uh, base64 decrypt, and then gzip decrypt to VDSO dot, oops, VDSO dot SO. So file star. And cool, we have VDSO dot SO. It is a ELF 32-bit LSB shared object. And now that we have the library downloaded, um, it's just an executable library, so we can look for gadgets. So uh, we do a Python 3 module pip install wrapper, and we'll do a wrapper, wrapper uh, file vdso.so, and we can see what gadgets we have. And so we got syscall, syscenter, we got a whole bunch of different pop gadgets that we can scroll up a little bit too. Uh, we got all of these different pop registers, so uh, more than enough fun stuff to play with. And these are just known offsets from the base of vdso, and with ASLR off, we know what that address is, so plenty of stuff to wrap with. Um, so pretty fun challenge. Like if you know you're supposed to be dumping VDSO, it's probably not too hard, but um, didn't know that at the time and given away free points. So it turns out there's been a couple of related VDSO CTF challenges. Uh, there was one as part of damn CTF 2020. Uh, this was kind of like a misc slash pwn. Uh, you were supposed to set some uh, stack variable and it turns out you can do that using the V syscall since it's at a known address, similar to the challenge we just did. Um, but you could wait for a certain time so that the I think the stack variable had to be like a yes or a no. And uh, using this uh, with the, the time function, the Linux time function, uh, you just wait for the correct second, which is pretty fun. Um, there was line 2021, pwn pwn box, uh, a very similar challenge. So you were just leaking VDSO for gadgets. There was an interesting one from Google 2017, pwn wiki, where you were supposed to uh, use the get time of day function to overwrite a different stack variable, specifically, I think a password or something like that. And then you would just say the password is equal to the current time, uh, which is pretty fun. Uh, then there was also for Seesaw 2015, pwn string IPC. Uh, this one was very cool. So you had an, it was a kernel challenge and you had an arbitrary write from kernel and they to use their exploit gadget was they inserted shellcode into the VDSO and then waited for a root process to call get time of day and so their shellcode would execute. Um, so very interesting exploit primitive. Um, I didn't see any, uh, but I'm guessing it exists. I feel like it would be a fun reversing challenge where you insert a backdoor into the VDSO similar to the Seesaw challenge and you just have persistence. Um, and so the goal of the challenge is to uh, figure out that it is VDSO that's uh, leaving this backdoor on disk somewhere and it's exploited whenever a process executes get time of day. Um, so it would be fun. Um, probably already exists, but if it doesn't, it'd be a fun challenge. Uh, here are some related resources I found very useful while researching it. Uh, I've mentioned a bunch of these, but a couple I haven't um, that just gave great background information. 
Um, if I said anything wrong, please let me know. Uh, you can leave a comment. Uh, I also leave a Discord down there so you can message me directly. There's a Discord channel where you can tell me things I did wrong or if I'm missing something exciting that I should have looked into. Uh, otherwise, uh, thanks for watching and I'll see you either at the next Security Topics or the next CTF. Cheers.